Hello friends, welcome to Expert Guidance. Today in this video, we'll be covering the Unit 4 of Adexel IGCSE Biology. The unit is Ecology and the Environment. Now, in this unit, we'll be covering four important topics. First, the organism in the environment, in which we'll be looking over the key terms of ecology like population, community, habitat, and ecosystem. And in this section, we'll also look over what are are the things that makes an ecosystem that is biotic and an abiotic factor and how do we investigate and study the uh, environmental aspects then in the second section we look over the feeding relationship like what are consumers producers the decomposers and we'll also look over the pyramids there's pyramids of numbers biomass and energy and we'll also look over how the energy transfer takes place along the food chain in the third section we'll cover the nutrient cycle in which we look over the carbon and the nitrogen cycle and in the last section we'll look over what are the human influences on the environment how human activities are affecting the environment with special reference to greenhouse effects global warming deforestation soil erosion okay now i would recommend you to watch this video till the end because after covering all these topics we'll be looking over some important definitions of this unit so let's begin first of all you should understand what is an ecological hierarchy what are the things that are contained in the ecosystem or in ecology so ecology starts with the level of organisms which are the individual species these groups of organisms that live in a similar area they make a population so you can see here there's a population of rats and then when you have groups of population in a different area that makes a community and then the community forms an ecosystem, which is the different communities along with this living and the known living factor. So you can see the cattle, which is living with the grasses and the water, and it is coordinating with the other species and different ecosystems like a land ecosystem or a forest ecosystem that makes up a whole biosphere. So the organism populations and communities the organism populations and communities so in a forest each pine tree is an organism together all the pine trees makes up a population and all the animals and the plant species in a forest it makes a community then this all groups of community forms an ecosystem this coastal ecosystem in the southeast united states includes living organism and the environment which they live in which includes the air water soil and the biosphere encompasses all the ecosystems of the earth so you should know what is the difference between the population community and an ecosystem so when we talk about ecosystem it is a groups of community which is interacting with the biotic and the abiotic factors what are the biotic factors the biotic factors are all the living organisms which are coordinating within an ecosystem that includes pathogens parasites predators prey mutualistic organism and the competitors the abiotic factors includes all the known living components like light soil ph temperature water wind air and minerals now you should know the explanation of both of these factors and how they interact within an ecosystem now, when we talk about the abiotic factors, most of the abiotic factors, they affect the photosynthesis, which affects the producers, which in turn affects the consumers and the complete food chain. So, for example, if there's less light, it will limit the photosynthesis. And if the photosynthesis is limited, there's less food for the herbivores, for the carnivores, and it will affect the food chain. And the light also uh, affects how the plants will look like. So, for example, the plants living in low light will have the broader leaves so that they can have the maximum surface area for absorption 
When we talk about water, again, water is required for growth. Less water will limit the photosynthesis, and there are a lot of adaptation that the plants and the animals shows in response to low water or the high water. Again, the pH makes the soil too acidic, which can limit the growth of the plant and can affect the food chain. The temperature can denature the enzyme, limit the photosynthesis, which can affect the entire food chain. The oxygen limits the growth as it is required for respiration. The carbon dioxide, again, is required for photosynthesis. And the plant growing in high wind will have different shapes. Wind will affect rate, rate of transpiration, rate of absorption of water, which will in turn affect the entire food chain. So all these abiotic factors are interconnected with each other. Next are the abiotic factor. Abiotic factor uh, are the factors which includes food. So food availability helps the species to grow and reproduce. Food is the animal sources of food. Pathogens can cause infectious diseases and it can affect the growth of the population. It can wipe the whole population. The parasites can also limit the growth by taking the nutrients from the host and they can affect the population of the community. Increasing competition can affect the growth of the population and it can outcompete the individuals of a population and predators increase in predation can decrease the population of the prey so all these biotic factors affects the population of the individuals within an ecosystem okay so now let us see what is interdependence interdependence is one species is dependent on another for example the plants or the flowers are dependent on the insects for their pollination reproduction and germination herbivores are dependent on plants for their food so if one species is removed it affects the other species and this is known as interdependence all the species are dependent on the other in the ecosystem now, let's see what is the competition in plants and animals. The competition is of two types. Interspecific, it is a competition between the members of the different species. They are members of different species which they fight for food, territory, resources. And this competition can either lead to the movement of the species to a new place. If they cannot outcompete, they can either lead to adaptation, makes them a better survivor. Or if there are organisms which cannot cope up with the competition, they can get extinct. On the other hand, interspecific competition is a competition between the members of the same species. So within the members of the same species, again, there could be a fight for the food, for the territory, and to find a suitable mate. Okay, now it's a very important topic. What are adaptations? And you need to know the different plants and the animal adaptations okay let us look at a very important concept which is adaptations so what are adaptations so adaptations are the special features that give the organism the survival advantage and helps the organism to survive in extreme conditions now primarily plant requirements are for water, space, minerals, carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, oxygen for respiration. So major adaptations of the plant are the ones that make them su successful in getting these components from the environment. In the similar way, animals require food to survive, oxygen for respiration, and a mate to reproduce. So the animal requirements can be structural, behavioral, and functional to get all these components from the environment now let us look at some of the plant adaptations in response to the plant challenges they face so the major challenge a plant uh, faces if it is in the desert is water loss and dry conditions so in those conditions the plant have small leaves leaves are reduced to spines so that the surface area for water loss can be reduced they have an extensive root system to absorb maximum water and they have succulent stems to store water these plants are also covered with waxy cuticle to limit the water loss for example cactus where leaves are reduced to spine and there's a marum grass which has curled leaves and sunken stomata that trap moist air between them to limit water loss there are plants that grow in rainforest where they are suffering from lots of rain and water with less light. So in those areas, leaves are brought to drop maximum sunlight and they have thin cuticles so that maximum water loss can happen. For example, epiphytes like lianas. Then there are plants which are growing in low nitrogen soils. These plants trap insects which helps 
them to digest them and fulfill their nitrogen and mineral requirements. For example, carnivorous plants like Venus flytrap. There are some plants which are prone to insect attack. These plants secrete chemicals like alkaloids or tannins, which helps them to repel the insect. For example, tobacco is produced, uh, tobacco plant produces nicotine as a chemical. Aquatic plants, they are growing in excess water and less light. For, their, for these plants, they have flexible stem to withstand water current. They have broad leaf to maximum light and they have air spaces in the leaf so that they can withstand this uh, water governance for example water lilies so you should know what are the different plant challenges and the adaptations with the example in the similar way there are two extreme types of animals we can find one living in the deserts which are suffering from hot dry climates and the arctic animals which have extreme living in extreme cozy conditions so for the desert animals the structural adaptations would be they have large ears to give up maximum heat and they are small with large surface area to volume ratios so that they can radiate maximum heat out. For the behavioral adaptation, they are more active during early morning and the evening when the temperature is not too high and too low. And when it is too hot or too low, uh, they rest in burrows. And the functional adaptation is they produce very concentrated or no urine so that they can prevent the water loss. For the Arctic animals like the polar bears, they have small surface area to volume ratio to prevent heat loss. They have fur or thick fat deposit to prevent insulin. White for also camouflage them with the eyes. Polar bears form big dens and they are strong swimmers that can swim through the ice. That is their behavioral adaptation. And the functional adaptation is the fur or the coat changes colors in summers and winters so that they can easily camouflage and prevent themselves from the predators. Okay, then there are certain organisms which are living in extreme temperature or extreme soil. These are extremophiles. The ones that are uh, living in the very hot conditions, they have enzymes that work at high temperature. They have high temperature optimum and do not get need denatured. For extreme cold, they have an antifreeze in their cells. The extreme salt, they have salt glands to expel excess salt and they also have adaptations in the cytoplasm that do not gain or lose water in response to salt. Okay, so I hope the different plants and animal adaptations are clear to you. Now, what are the various ways in which we can study the distribution or the abundance of living organisms? To study the communities, we have two methods. One that is shown here is a quadrat method. You must have done this experiment in your school. In quadrat method, we place random squares at different points and the species within that square is counted. In the transact method, a line is placed and the species that are coming within this line or a half inch above or below this line are counted and recorded. Now, there are certain terms you should know about the practical. The sample size is the sample to be taken for observation. We calculate all the data and then we find the mean. So mean is the statistical value, which is calculated by adding all the values divided by the total number of values. Then median is the middle value of the data. Mode is that value that has the greatest frequency and range is the highest value, take away the lowest value. Okay, so I hope you know what are the various ways of studying communities and what are the different statistical measurements that we do while studying the communities. Now let us come to a very important concept of trophic levels. Now what are trophic levels? Trophic levels are the different levels of the food chain and the food chain always start with the producers. So the producers, they are the ones that produce the food through photosynthesis and these are the ones that traps the sunlight and converts into chemical energy. These producers, they are eaten by the primary consumers which are the herbivores. Then these herbivores are eaten by the secondary consumers which are the carnivores and then these carnivores are eaten by the top carnivores which are the tertiary consumers. Now when all of them they get dead then there are another trophic level which is the decomposers which food feed on dead and decaying matter and cause the decay effect. Okay, so you should know what are the different levels of the trophic levels and these trophic levels are interconnected with the food chain. So food chain is a relationship between who eats whom. So you can see the leaf is eaten by a caterpillar, then by chameleon, then snake and the mangoes. The leaf is a producer, caterpillar is a herbivore, which is a primary consumer. Chameleon is a carnivore, which is a secondary consumer. Snake is another carnivore, which is a tertiary consumer and mangoes becomes a top consumer. At each level, there's a loss of energy 
energy and only 10% is transferred to the next trophic level. Therefore, food chains are mostly restricted to three or four trophic levels so that we have maximum energy to the top level of the food chain. And for the food chain, you should remember sun is a principal source of energy which is driving the entire food chain. Now, this is a very important graph you have, which is the predator-prey relationship. Now, you can see in this graph what is happening is, first of all, there's an increase in prey due to more food available for them. As there will be increase in prey, what will happen? Uh, the When there's an increase in prey, what will happen? The predators will also increase because there will be more food for them. But as predator will increase, it will cause a fall in the prey because all the prey will be eaten up. Now, as the prey decreases, the predator also decreases because of no food available for the predators. Now, as the predator decreases, the prey tends to increase because of less predation. But as the prey increases, again, more food will be available for the predators. That will result in an increase in predator. So this cycle continues. So prey increases, predator increases. Then when predator increases, the prey decreases. And when prey decreases, the predator decreases. And then this whole cycle continues. Okay, so I hope you understand this trap and what is the relationship between predators and prey. Now, at each trophic level, we can measure the biomass. Biomass is the mass of the material contained in the living organism. And we can give them a graphical representation in the form of a pyramid. And we will see that the producers, they have the maximum biomass. And then uh, since a lot of energy loss happens at this stage, the biomass at the next stage is less, followed by decrease in biomass to the next stage. And the top carnivores has a very less biomass. Okay, and at each stage, the biomass is lost as waste product. Okay, now when we, uh, rather than doing the biomass, we can do the numbers. Then we can see, we can either get an upright graph or the bell-shaped pyramid. So if we see in the aquatic ecosystem, there are few plants that supports a great population of zooplankton. And this great population of zooplankton is enough for a small population of herring. And this herring can only support one sea organism. So in this way, we get a different shape. But if we talk about the terrestrial ecosystem, large number of grubs are a food for just few grasshoppers. And these few grasshoppers can be eaten by few mice and just one snake can eat all of them. Okay, so it can be upright, inverted or upside down. But when we talk about the pyramids of energy, which is a graphical representation of energy at each trophic level, it is always upright because at each level, there's just 10% of the energies that can transfer. You can see there's 100% of the primary uh, producers, primary consumers get just 10% of that. Secondary consumers get 1, 0 0.1 and 0 0.01. Now at each stage, this trophic level is is losing energy because it is requiring the energy for movement, growth, and repair. Energy is required in digestion. It is required to digest a very undigestible food. Energy is lost in maintaining the constant body temperature and energy is also lost as heat during respiration. So you should know what are the various ways in which heat is lost at each trophic level. Now there's a very important concept that in an ecosystem the materials need to be recycled. Now how the materials get recycled, it is the decomposers that play a very important role because they feed on dead and decaying matter, they break the organic matter into into simple components and return them into soil. The products like carbon dioxide or gases, they are released into the atmosphere. Okay, and protein in the dead and decay matter is converted into nitrates and returned to the soil by decomposers. So you can see sun is a principal source of energy, which is giving the energy to the producers. Producers is giving the energies to the herbivores and carnivores. And as all of them is dying, it is the decomposers, which is breaking them and returning the mineral nutrient pool back into the soil, which goes with the producers. Okay, now building on that, there are two cycles which are there in your syllabus. Cycle number one is the water cycle. Now, what is happening in a water cycle is, let's try to understand that. This is a water body, which is like a lake or a sea, or it could be a river. The water is evaporated. The water is evaporated from oceans, lake and stream, and transpiration from plants and respiration also evaporates water into the atmosphere.
then these water all these water vapors they get cooled by the process of condensation and forms cloud then with more transpiration the clouds eventually burst and fall off as rain as precipitate and gets into a surface runoff or into the water bodies and again they evaporate and the cycle continues so what a cycle consists of evaporation transpiration respiration condensation and precipitation and again the cycle starts in evaporation water is evaporated from the water bodies like sea lakes etc to form water vapors in transpiration the water vapors are also lost from the surface of the plant in respiration it is producing water vapors and it is lost in the form of water vapors in condensation the water vapors from all the above sources cools and condenses to form clouds and in precipitation when the clouds gets full the fall of the rain and the cycle continues okay now let's do another cycle which is a carbon cycle now carbon cycle is easy it's just photosynthesis respiration combustion decomposition fossilization there's a carbon dioxide in the atmosphere taken by the plants for photosynthesis so the carbon dioxide is used up by the plants for photosynthesis then the plant is eaten by the animals and the decomposers all of them respire and returns the carbon dioxide back and all of them can die and form a fossil fuels and then when the fossil fuel burns it again releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere so the first stage is photosynthesis which is taking away the carbon dioxide respiration combustion decomposition and fossilization is giving carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and the cycle continues okay now next is a very important concept which is decomposition what are decomposers decomposers are the microorganism that breaks the dead and decay materials into simple components they are very important as they return the nutrients and minerals back into the atmosphere so when plant and animals die it is the decomposers that breaks the dead and decaying plant and animals into simple components which are recycled in the atmosphere now for the decay to happen oxygen warm conditions and moist conditions are required the decay process forms methane which can be used as fuel and decay process also produce compost which can be as a manure so decomposition is a very important step for sustaining the ecosystem now what is biodiversity when we are talking about the ecosystem we are talking about the bio biotic factors and the major thing that comes to our mind is biodiversity biodiversity is the measure of number of different species in an area greater the biodiversity more stable is the ecosystem and less dependency on the other organism now why is biodiversity is important biodiversity is important to make the ecological balance as one species is dependent on the other it is required for medicine like medicinal plants it is required for agriculture and poultry it is required to maintain ecotourism now since species are dependent on one another if one species is affected it can affect the entire population now what are the major threats of biodiversity that we have the biggest threat is deforestation which is caused due to rapid population growth where we are clearing up the forest for making industries and homes which is causing habit change climate change and global warming population growth leading to reforestation and monoculture agriculture increasing food demand causing monoculture causing reduction in the gene pool and industrialization due to increasing population size so these are the biggest threat we are facing with the biodiversity now as with the human uh, activities there is a lot of pollution pollution that is there and the biggest pollution threat is the air pollution now the biggest cause contributor of the air pollution is the acid rain now what exactly is acid rain now we know that fossil fuels they are made up of carbon and at times they have sulfur and nitrogen now carbon when burns from carbon dioxide sulfur from sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide carbon dioxide it contributes to global warming but sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide they come and they react with the rain water and as the sulfur dioxide reacts with rain water it forms sulfuric acid and when nitrogen dioxide reacts with the rain water it forms nitric acid and they fall off as an acid rain and what effect they are doing they are making the soil acidic damaging trees and the aquatic life they are corroding the building and eroding the rocks
So you can see in this, the acid gases are released into the atmosphere. They are carried up by the winds. They combine with the uh, water droplets, form the acid rain. And this acid rain dis destroys plants, pollutes water sources and soil and roads the building. Now, how we can get away with this problem? To get away with this problem, we should decrease the use of fossil fuel, treat the waste to remove nitrogen and sulfur before evolving into the atmosphere, and use alternative sources of energy. Okay, so I hope the process of acid rain, its effect and prevention is clear to you. Now, another contributor of uh, air pollution is smog. You can see at time you see a dimming effect in the atmosphere. This is because of the nitrogen dioxide and the sulfur dioxide particulates in the lower atmosphere. They're depleting the ozone layer, causing dimming effect, lowering the Earth's temperature. And if these are inhaled, they cause damage to lungs, respiratory problems and the cardiovascular diseases. Now, next after the air pollution comes the water pollution. And the biggest cause of water pollution are the fertilizers and the agricultural waste. They get washed away and go into the nearest water body. As they go into the nearest water body, they cause an algal bloom. And you must have seen at times the water body is covered with green scum. This is an algal bloom. This algae forms a layer of water, layer on top of the water, cutting the light coming in and it stops the photosynthesis. Since light is not received, the plants die. When plants die, the oxygen content of the water decreases and then the death of plant uh, also causes the death of other species which are dependent on plant and then they all die and then the decomposers come in which try to decay this and further decreases the oxygen in the water body thereby completing depleting the water body with the oxygen and this whole process is eutrophication causing the death of the aquatic life and this is what is a major contributor to water pollution Apart from eutrophication, another problem is the biomagnification. You can see here, the lake has become toxic because of some chemical waste. When this chemical waste is eaten by the fish, the toxic level increases. When this uh, harmful component passes along the food chain, its toxic level keep on increasing. This is known as biomagnification. So as the toxic products go along the food chain, the concentration of the toxic chemical increases. Next is the land pollution. The land pollution contributors are the solid waste like plastic, metals and other man-made chemicals that fills the landfill site and the chemicals that comes from industries and the agricultural site or the agricultural waste which are the spray of insecticides, pesticides, weedicides which contributes to land pollution. Now, this is what all the pollutions are doing to the human body. Air pollution, water pollution, soil contamination with the pesticides. It is causing nerve damage, ozone layer depression, cardiovascular illness, respiratory illness, cancer risk, skin irritation, gastroenteritis, and host of other problems. So it is very important that the pollution effects are understood and steps are taken to mitigate the same. Now, the important contributor to everything is deforestation. How is deforestation caused? It is caused by rapid cutting of the trees due to rapid industrialization, population growth and urbanization, clearing of the forest for making homes and industry, and increase in agriculture to grow food and fuel crops. So you can see that the carbon dioxide is being increased when we cut the trees. Okay, and uh, the nutrients, the agricultural waste is causing the flushing of the nutrients and it is causing the water pollution. And this cutting of forests is contributing to climate change. So deforestation is the cause of many different problems. Now let us look at what are the effects of deforestation. So deforestation is causing increase in carbon dioxide level, causing global warming and climate change. It is causing loss of biodiversity due to habitat uh, destruction. And it is also causing extinction of species because due to rapid climate change, the species are not able to adapt themselves. Now there's another important concept of peat bog destruction. Now what is a peat? Now it is a plant material that is not decayed due to acidic conditions or the conditions not favorable for decay. And it forms peatlands and peat bogs, and they are the massive storehouse for carbon and they host many other organisms. Now this peat is a unique carbon store. It is the habitat of many microorganisms and plants and animals that can survive in acidic condition and peat can be used as fuel.
Now, due to the destruction, due to deforestation, there's a reduction in peat bark causing loss of biodiversity and it takes millions of years to form and it is also the threat to the biodiversity. Now, what is a greenhouse effect? Now, if you look at this diagram, the solar radiation comes to the Earth atmosphere and the Earth reflects it back. Now, most of the radiation is not allowed to reflect back. Some of the infrared radiation passed through the atmosphere, some is absorbed and re-emitted in all direction by greenhouse gas molecule. The effect of this is to warm the Earth's atmosphere and lower the atmosphere temperature. So you can see that when the Earth rays are coming, they are reflected back, but this blanket is being formed by the greenhouse gases which are mainly carbon dioxide methane and water vapor and it is not allowing the infrared radiation to reflect back and they are emitted back into the earth's atmosphere causing the heating this is a greenhouse effect but this greenhouse effect is increasing because of the increase in concentration of carbon dioxide due to rapid deforestation and what it is causing it is causing a climate change habitat loss floods, change in migration of birds, change in distributions of plants and animals, changing in the seasonal pattern and loss of biodiversity causing extinction of species. So you can see in this diagram that the Earth's temp uh, temperature has risen about one degree in the last century and the past 50 years of warming has been attributed to the human activities. And what are those human activities? Burning fuels such as coal, natural gas and oil produces greenhouse gases in excessive amount. Greenhouse gases are emissions that rise into the atmosphere and traps the sun energy keeping heat from escaping. Now most of the world's emissions are attributed to the United States, large-scale use of fuels, vehicles and factories and some predictions for local changes include increasing in summers and intense thunderstorm, damaging storm, droughts and related weathers and phenomena are attributed to this greenhouse effect. So you should know what is greenhouse effect, how it is attributing to global warming and what are the consequences of that. So you should elaborate these points properly. Now, since now we have seen that biodiversity is very important to us and there are many ways in which biodiversity is at threat, we should maintain the biodiversity. Now, how we can maintain the biodiversity? First, we can do in situ conservation. In situ conservation is protecting the endangered species in their own natural habitat, like making national parks, wildlife centuries, making biosphere reserves. And in these in situ conservation, we also carry out breeding programs. And these breeding programs are caused to increase the population of endangered species. In ex situ conservation, we make protected areas where conservation is connected, like zoos, botanical garden, tissue culture, seed banks, and gene banks. Then we can prevent the deforestation and the combustion that can reduce the carbon emission and we can recycle and use alternative sources of energy which can reduce the dependency on the fossil fuel causing reducing the carbon emission preventing global warming climate change and its effect. Now the last topic that we need to do is food security. What is food security? Food security people say is going sufficient healthy food to feed the population but it's not the complete definition. Food security is growing sufficient healthy food to feed the population and accessibility of the population to grow or buy that healthy food. Now, there are a lot of factors that is affecting food security. First is population growth. Rapid population growth make it difficult to make this food available to all. Inclination towards unhealthy and easy to cook food, junk food, spread of diseases, pest and insect attack to the crop, climate change, acid rain and pollution, water pollution, increase in cost of agriculture supply and the food versus fuel. These are all the factors that are affecting food security and you should know and elaborate all these factors. So to maintain food security, we should do efficient food production and how we can do that. First, we can uh, increase more plant-based products because plants are lower in the food chain so they will have highest biomass and highest energy. So when we use plant-based products, they reduces the dependency on animal products and gives more energy. Second, if we reduce the level of food chain and either eat the herbivore or the plant-based product, then we can get maximum energy. Or we can use intensive farming. Now, in intensive farming, animals and plants are grown in a greenhouse or a proper control conditions so that we can limit the energy loss and produce maximum biomass. 
Now you can see in this figure, the chickens are grown with the restricted movement so that when they move, they do not lose the energy. We rear them at a constant temperature so that they do not lose energy in maintaining the body temperature. We give them easy to digest food so that they don't waste energy in digesting the food. And we give them protein rich diet that helps them to grow more biomass. So these are all the factors that we can use to increase the biomass and increase food production. Or the best alternative that we have now is using microorganisms for food production. For example, microprotein is a source, protein rich source from the fungi. So fungi reduces the depth dependency on the plants and the animals and can conserve the biodiversity. And you know microorganisms are very easy to grow. We can grow them by fermentation. And if this is a setup of a fermenter, it has a water jacket to maintain the optimum temperature. It has an inlet of oxygen inlets for nutrients. It has a motor at the top to rotate these pedals. These pedals rotate and they stir the mixture so that the microorganisms do not settle at the bottom and make the temperature and resources even. Now, in the food production, we also use genetic engineering to increase the yield of the crop and making more disease resistant and high yield variety crops. And we can also use microorganisms for food production. Okay, so I hope all these topics are now clear to you. Now you should know and define all these key terms. You should know what is a community, ecosystem, interdependence, stable communities, abiotic factor, biotic factor, predator, prey, pathogen, parasite, competition, abundance, distribution, quadrat, sample size, mean, quantitative sampling, range, median, mode, transact, adaptation, biomass, producers, consumers, water cycle, what is precipitation, condensation, evaporation, transpiration, photosynthesis, respiration, combustion, decomposition, decay cycle, biodiversity, acid rain, smog, eutrophication, biomagnification, global warming, greenhouse effect, trophic levels, pyramids of biomass, numbers, food security, fermenter, biotechnology, microprotein, so you can answer these terms, give a pause to the video, try these questions. If you are still not clear, look at the video again or if it's your textbook. Okay. Now, as always, what is our next step? You should check the specification. Make sure everything in the specification is crystal clear to you and do the exam questions on this topic, which can be found on my website. All these notes along with these slides are there on my website. The link is mentioned in the description box below. If you like this video, then do subscribe to the channel and do not forget to like, comment and share this video. Also, do click on the bell icon so that you get notified whenever I make a new video. And I promise you I'll be, loading, I'll be uploading loads of videos useful for you before your exams. Okay, if you still have any doubts, you can take an advantage of our 24-7 chat support on our website where you can come anytime, post any of your queries and get instant reply. Okay, so I'll see you next in the next video. And if there's any specific video you want me to make a video on, do leave a comment below and I'll make sure I have that up before your exam. Till then, happy revising.